welcome you on this 4th of July weekend as we gather together, um, praying that everybody stays safe for the 4th of July, but as we gather together to praise God, to, um, you know, come together to grow. My name is Melissa Claxton. I am the pastor here at Warren First. Blessed to be here for another year um, as we pray for all of those. <laughs> All of those in the United Methodist Church that are transitioning this week. Um, so take a moment to greet one another here in the building. Turn to someone near you. Let them know you're happy that they are here. If you are joining us from somewhere else, even if you can't greet one another by text, just shout out hi. Twyla is going to bring us together with music this morning. Good morning, everyone. So glad you're here, even if it's kind of gray, dismal day. We can praise God. So those in, in the sanctuary, if you can rise to join us in the song. Those at home, please join us in an attitude of worship and praise. We're going to sing 10,000 Reasons to Love the Lord. <laughs>
Good morning. My name is Linda Sadowski, and it's my pleasure to be your lay reader this morning. Please join me responsibly in the call to worship. Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. We hunger for the bread of Jesus, the bread of life, and we thirst for you, O God. O God, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. We hunger for the bread of Jesus, the bread of life, and we thirst for you, O God. There is forgiveness with you, and I wait for you, O God. My soul waits for you. We hunger for the bread of Jesus, the bread of life, and we thirst for you, O God. In your words, I hope, my soul waits for you. God, more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning, we hunger for the bread of Jesus, the bread of life, and we thirst for you, O oh God. Please join with me and the praise team up here as we sing They'll know we are Christians by our love. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Wouldn't that be great if the world knew when they came in contact with us that we were Christians because of the way that we love one another. Jesus said, love God, love one another. That's what's important. That's what we're called to do. So today on this 4th of July weekend, we come together to worship God. Um, we come together, and as we come together, we're going to pray for our country. You know, I love, I, I, for those that don't know me, I came from rural America. I came from Jackson area, a small town where I raised my kids. And I came to Warren five years ago, and I'm going to tell you, I fell in love with my neighborhood. I love the diversity of my neighborhood. I love the diversity of the people that I find in this community. 
Um, I can see God all around me, and I love that. I love that about the United States. And so we pray for our country, that we care about one another, that we appreciate our diversity, that we grow together, that we become a nation that really does honor God by the way that we love one another. Um, we also, we pray for one another as we gather together, and I was going to grab a prayer card out of the pews, but I don't see any in the pews. So um, we do have prayer cards. If you would like us to pray for you, I invite you to um, fill out those prayer cards. If you are joining us from someplace other than here in the building, there are ways online. Our website has a whole prayer page. You can send us a request, and it can be private, it can be public, um, whatever you want, please let us know. We want to pray for you in this moment. Let us go to God. God, we do thank you for gathering us together in this place. We thank you for community, diversity, grace, and more importantly, love. We thank you for your love for each and every one of us, and we thank you for the love that you put in us that you want us to share with the world. We thank you. As we gather together in this place on this 4th of July weekend, we do lift up our, our country. As we celebrate the birth of our nation, we lift up our leaders. May they seek your wisdom. May they care about all of the people. And may they work to do what's best for all of us in creating community. We pray that there be an end to war, not only in our country, but all across the world, we pray, knowing that they are all your people. We pray for each and every one of us, whether here in the building or gathered today or throughout the week, however we are able to gather, we are a community of faith dedicated to lifting one another up. We pray for each other. May we be the community that is needed in this place to connect people to your love, to grow disciples of your son, Jesus Christ, who serve you by serving one another, we pray. And as we gather today, we know that we come from life. And life often holds within it some heavy burdens. We pray for one another in this time. So Lord, as we hear our prayers, as we lift these prayers up to you. God, you know the needs before we even ask, you know. We place these in your loving arms, trusting that you are already at work as we continue to offer ourselves to be your hands, your feet, your heart in the lives of those we've lifted up and in the life of our communities. We pray this as we pray together, one church, one voice across the globe in praying these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as you know, we've been asking people what their favorite hymn is and asking them to put it in the basket out in the hallway. And we continue to do that. We also ask those of you who are online to do the same. You can send us an email here at the church if you have a special song or a praise tune that you'd like us to sing during this time while the choir's on hiatus. Today's song is a spirit song. Amen. This morning's scripture is from John, chapter 6, verse 25 through 40, and also Matthew 5, verse 6. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? 
Our ancestors ate the manna in the, des in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them at the last day. Now Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The word of God for the people of God. That's what we're talking about during this series is what does it mean to be blessed by God? What does it truly mean to experience that blessing today in this world? Um, not just the next, but right now in this world. And so we have been going through um, these blessings. We find them early on in Jesus' ministry in the Sermon on the Mount. He has really re relatively new to the scene. I mean, we find that early in Matthew's gospel. So this is right after his baptism and his, his time in the wilderness. And he has gathered his disciples together. He is already making a name for himself. People are already following him. And he sets his disciples down around them and he goes, this is what is important. And so he shares the Sermon on the Mount. Now, I have encouraged you to, throughout this series, to take time, and maybe every week take time, to sit down and read the Sermon on the Mount. It is found in Matthew 5 through Matthew 7, relatively short, but there is a lot in it about what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And so Jesus starts the sermon by talking about what it means to be blessed, which is a lot different than what the world tells us that it means to be blessed. Jesus starts by saying, blessed are those who are poor in spirit, or as Eugene Peterson puts it in the message, which I love his version better, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. I've been at the end of my rope. Not always, but there are times in life where we find ourselves in that place where we are spiritually poor in spirit. 
Peterson goes, with less of you, there's more of God in his rule. In those moments, we discover God and that we're not alone, that God is with us. God walks with us. The second beatitude is, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted in our grief. We learn what love is. In our grief, we find that God is walking beside us. In our grief, we find that there is something beyond this that we can learn, that we can grow. Last week, we talked about blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. When we are meek, when we are, are gentle, when we are kind and compassionate and humble, we discover God's kingdom is right here in this world. So today we continue with the next beatitude, and the next one is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Let us take a moment to invite God into this space of discernment. God, we do come together to grow, to support one another, to live in community with one another, to serve with one another, to grow with one another. I always ask that, that what I share is true to your spirit and, and where your spirit is leading us in this time. I ask that we all have open hearts, open minds, open spirits for where you are calling us to go and how you're calling us to grow as disciples, as your children, as people who are righteous. We pray this in Christ's name, always. Amen. So as I was thinking about this passage, I was thinking about being hungry. We've all experienced hunger pains, right? All of us have been hungry at one time or another, or thirsty, really, really thirsty. Um, maybe not to the extent as some around the world, but we've all experienced that. When my kids were growing up um, in, in our little community, the, the church that I would eventually go on to serve as pastor North Parma was, was how, home to our youth group. Um, all of the Methodist churches in that area would send their kids to North Parma for youth group. And so Pam, who was really devoted to the, I give her credit to the middle schoolers, um, give me the high schoolers or the shorter people, Middle schoolers are a tough bunch to handle, but she was really dedicated to the middle schoolers. And every year she does, continues to do for decades now, um, the 30-hour famine through World Vision. And I really give her credit for this because here she's not only got middle schoolers, but the 30-hour famine means that those middle schoolers are going to go without food for 30 hours. <laughs> And so she did that every year, and um, they would uh, uh, start on, at noon on Saturday. Um, they would start fasting, which usually meant that at 11.30 on Saturday, they had a really, really big lunch to get them through. And then at 6 p.m. Saturday night, they would gather together at the church for an overnight, and they would stay together until 6 p.m. Sunday night. No food. They would have water breaks. They would have juice breaks. No food. With one exception, on Sunday mornings, they would, um, when they gathered together, they would have what is called plumpy nut. And plumpy nut is this uh, mixture of peanut butter and sugar and powdered milk. And it's kind of, it, it's a food that they use to help children that are really malnutritioned um, in other countries. It's, it's kind of a food that um, digests easily and their body doesn't reject. And so they get to taste what people, children that are starving would be given on their road, or the journey back to health. So through this 30 hours, or particularly the 24 hours between Saturday at 6 p.m. and Sunday at 6 p.m., the kids would gather together in the same space, and they would learn about kids across the globe that are struggling with uh, food security, um, they would learn their story, and they would raise money. And I, I've seen how World Vision has helps with World Vision helps with um, world hunger and access to water, clean drinking water across the globe. And I've seen from when my oldest daughter, who is now 
what, 37 or something, when she was in elementary school, um, or when she was in middle school, to the time that when I served there and left there five years ago, the numbers of children that are starving every day decreased drastically. So things are happening. Hunger. We deal with it throughout the globe. We know what it feels like to be hungry. Maybe not to the extent of these children that our kids learned about, but we know what it means to be hungry. We know what it means to be thirsty. I love how Jesus always used this imagery that people would understand to talk about a truth, a, a, a profound truth. Our youth understood hungry, especially after 30 hours of going without food. Um, I found that even the pickiest kids were a little less picky when you're that hungry. We know what it means. We know what it means to be thirsty. Work outside on a hot day. Eat a bag of chips. <laughs> we know what it means to be thirsty. So God, or so Jesus used these normal everyday images to help people understand a very deep spiritual truth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I think the key word here is righteousness. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does righteousness mean? Well, you know me, I looked it up. <laughs> I looked it up. What does righteousness mean? Well, a lot of the definitions said the only uh, one of them, a lot of them were like this. Uh, righteousness is an attribute that belongs to God, the lawgiver, and is manifested in his law. Only God is righteous, it kept saying. Only God is righteous. In order to be righteous, one needed to follow all of God's laws. Well, if, if you look at those laws as what's written in the Old Testament, those 613 laws, it's nearly impossible to do. Actually, there's a guy that recently tried to follow all of those laws, and his wife got so fed up with it that when she was on her menstrual cycle, she sat in every chair in the house so that he couldn't sat, sit on them, <laughs> because that's what the law said. She was tired of it. <laughs> Maybe we can't find righteousness by following all of the rules. But we do know that we can achieve righteousness because Moses called Noah righteous in Genesis 6. He, Moses said, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. And then in Acts 10, we uh, read that Cornelius, the centurion, he is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all of the Jewish people. And then in Luke 2, we have Simeon. Simeon who lived in the temple. And it says, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon and the, man, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. He was a righteous man. So what does it mean to be righteous? Well, I'm going to go back a little ways to the 16th century to Martin Luther, who wrote in, in 1518, he wrote this sermon titled to be righteous or titled two kinds of righteousness. He wrote that to be righteous is to be human as God envisioned in creation. And again in redemption. He outlined two kinds of righteousness. There is the righteousness quorum deo in the presence of God. Righteousness in the presence of God. Righteousness is this beautiful gift that we get from God. This beautiful gift, this righteousness comes when a person is in right relationship with God. Not perfect, not perfect in love. We're on a journey to become perfect in love. 
But righteousness is this beautiful gift that we receive from God when we are in this right relationship with God. When we're striving for that. I love Paul wrote in Romans 3.22. We just finished a study on Romans. In Romans 3.22 he wrote, The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus connects us to God. Righteousness quorum Dio comes not out of perfection of any kind, not out of our works or our piety or our intellect. It comes by choosing to have this relationship with God that we get in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It comes from choosing to develop a right relationship with God. It means Korah, Quorum Dio means something that takes place in the presence of or before the face of God. We are made righteous through choosing that relationship. So that's the first kind of righteousness. I think, though, what what we find in, in this beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, is that we need both kinds of righteousness. We need that right relationship with God, but then... Luther outlines a second kind of righteousness, which is righteousness quorum mundo, righteousness in the eyes of the world. That's what happens when we choose to live in that right relationship with God, right? It changes who we are. It changes how we live. It changes what we do. People begin to see it because, you remember, let, us, let them know that we are Christians by our love. People begin to see it because it becomes an active part of who we are. We begin to live it out in ways that, that we begin to love our neighbors differently, more profoundly. We begin to see their struggles and care about what's going on in their lives. We begin to care about people that we don't even know, we don't, are never going to meet, but we want them to have enough food. We want them to have clean drinking water, access to health care. You know, one of the guiding passages for my life when I came here, I had to write this little bio for all of you five years ago. And it asked me, one of the questions it asked is, what is one of your guiding passages that has not changed? It comes from the book of James. James 2, where he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and food daily. If if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Faith without works is dead. Righteousness is not true righteousness if it's not changing our lives to the point where we are actively living out our faith. Righteousness is choosing a right relationship with God. It's also choosing to allow God to change our lives. That's what it is. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You're blessed when you work up a good appetite. This is Eugene Peterson in the message for God. When you work up a good appetite for God, his food and drink is the best meal you'll ever eat. Peterson had a way with words. You're blessed when you hunger and thirst for God. And I thought about that this week. What do we do when we hunger? We seek something to eat. 
What do we do when we're thirsty? We seek something to drink. When we're spiritually hungry and we're spiritually thirsty for righteousness for God, we seek. We seek to fill that. We seek to, to allow God to transform our lives. We seek to um, have our lives transformed to the point where we are living into who God created us to be. We seek when we're and Jesus tells us when we seek that, we're going to be filled. We're going to find it. We're going to find it. We seek that. We're going to look for ways in which we can be fed, in which we can, our thirst can be quenched. We're going to read scripture, which is God's story unfolding in the lives of everyday people like you and I. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to find your story in scripture. People that were striving to connect with God. People who are striving to grow in love. We're going to find Jesus who tells us to love God and love one another. Righteousness quorum Dio and righteousness quorum Mundo working together. When we're thirsty and we're hungry for righteousness, we come together in worship. We grow with one another. We study together where two or more are gathered. I am there with them, Matthew 18, 20. When we are striving for righteousness, we are looking for ways in which we can serve God by serving others. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled in our other passage today, Jesus reminds us that he is the bread of life. He says, whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and wh whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. In Christ, we find food. In Christ, we find drink. In Christ, we find connection to God. We find righteousness in Christ. When we hunger and we thirst, we seek that which will fulfill, and we find that in Christ. Today is Communion Sunday. Um, I should have said that for those of you at home. I apologize for those of you at home. I give you a few minutes to go get whatever your pantry allows as we gather together um, to share in communion. I remind you that Christ sets this table. That at the very end of his life, when he knew that his journey here was coming to an end and he was going to leave his disciples to carry on his work, he gathered them together. They shared the Passover meal and he took regular elements that were on the table and he reminded them that he was the bread of life that he was this wine, this, this cup filled with compassion, and that together this was food for our journey, compassion for our journey, that we could um, continue on that work. So I invite you to join me in the communion prayer together. Let us pray. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity. You made covenant to be our sovereign God and spoke to us through your prophets who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like water and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. When nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth in the company of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. 
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. Your spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed to anoint that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick. He fed the hungry. He ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at the right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up, Lord, he took bread. He gave thanks to you, God. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, God, said, This is my blood a new covenant poured out for all for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, remember me. And in these, your my, and so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. God, we ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, God now and forever. Amen. I invite our communion stewards to come up and prepare to offer communion. Um, the table is open in the United Methodist Church. We believe that Jesus set this table. Jesus invites you to this table. The table is open to everyone. Um, here in the building, we take communion by intinction. We'll give you bread. You dip it in the juice um, before you take it. Or we have communion to-go cups. Um, for those that want or need something a little um, safer. The body of Christ, broken for you. Sorry. The blood of Christ. The body of Christ, broken for you, Jackie. The body of Christ. Broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. Thanks. In remembrance of me, eat this bread. In remembrance of me, Drink this wine in remembrance of me. Pray for the time when God's own will is done. In remembrance of me, heal the sick. In remembrance of me, Feed the poor in remembrance of me. Open the door and let your neighbors in. Let them in. Take, eat, and become forted. Drink and remember too that this is my body and precious blood shed for you, shed for you. 
in remembrance of me search for truth in remembrance of me always love in remembrance of me don't look above but in your heart look for God do this in remembrance of me God, we thank you for this wonderful sacrament and that in remembrance of your son, Jesus Christ, we come to this table. We come to this table as righteous, not because of our perfection, but because of your love. We come to this table seeking to live out that righteousness in all that we do out into the world in being your hands, your feet, your heart for those that we meet. We ask that you continue to work in us so that the world will know that we are Christians, followers of Christ, because of the way that we love one another. Not what we believe, but how we live. Amen. So as, sorry. Thank you. So as we uh, get ready, they're going to come up. We're going to sing a final song, and I'm going to kick you out of the church building as the church, reminding you to uh, be the church. So we have a few announcements. One is, it is the first Sunday. We have coffee hour after church, so um, hopefully you that are in the building will gather together in fellowship. Um, I'm excited that in two weeks, you know, our, our mission statement here at Warren First is to connect, grow, serve. We connect people to the love of God. We grow disciples of Jesus Christ who are serving God by serving others. The church should know that we love. And so in two weeks, a uh, week and a half, actually, we're starting a brand new study on Wednesdays. And if anybody is interested in having this conversation in the evening, we will do that too. Just let me know. We're starting a new book called Love Over Fear. Love Over Fear. How to respond with love over fear in a polarized world. I'm really looking forward to this conversation um, because... All of our conversations, we talk about how we live this out. And so that's an opportunity to grow together and be more loving. We have opportunity to serve. Capuchin is coming up. And tonight, every um, Sunday night at 6 p.m., we gather again. There's a few of us where two or more are gathered um, to have more conversation about what we talked about this morning. So if you want a worship service that's conversation-based, we would love for you to join us in the building, the other end of the building on Sunday nights. Twyla. Can we once again rise, because we're singing to God, and those of you at home, if you can't rise, that's fine too, but sing along in the attitude. Here I am, Lord.
Where you lead me, I will go, Lord, where you lead me. As you go from this place into the week ahead, I do hope that you keep your eyes open for God because God is all around. Watch for his great works. Be alert for signs of God's presence in the world. For he, for he is, is God, God, our God, ruler of all the earth, and, and we are his people, sent to share his love with us all we need. Go and be that church. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.